Start the recording. Okay. We are live. Yes. All right. So this is a, a meeting of uh, the some Plenty maintainers. So uh, I'm Jim. I maintain the, the Plenty Go project. I have uh, contracted with Jesse to help me with some of the CMS capabilities. Mm -hmm. So we're at this part at this point now in the project lifecycle where we're trying to actually figure out how to get some of the editing capabilities into the system. Um, now, Jesse, I figured it might be helpful to just kind of go through a little bit of like where Plenty is today and where we're hoping it's going and, and some of the capabilities we're thinking about adding. Does that sound like a good yeah, plan? Yeah, okay. actually, because I'm not so familiar with Plenty and its, its life cycle, so or yeah. its journey through the development. So it would be fun. Yeah, great. Um, so yeah, and actually just a little background. So we met through this felt issue queue, I believe. We were actually working on similar things. We were both uh, uh, interested in, in some of the similar topics. And the issue is still open. <laughs> yeah, the issue is still open, yep. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of like... I've yet a... to done it. Oh, did you? Yeah. I haven't done it yet. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's always still like... still work in progress if I will do it. I can't remember. Was that for SSR? I can't even remember what that yeah, particular issue was. Yeah, uh, asynchronous loading, asynchronous server-side rendering. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so we, in, in Plenty, we tried to get around that. So basically, mm -hmm. so we had, the issue that I was having in particular was um, we have all these kind of like dynamic components that we were adding to the page, but there was, uh, mm -hmm. you had to do a lot of that work asynchronously. And then when you actually wanted to build the static fallback, so every one of the pages that gets created in Plenty has like an HTML fallback. Um, and we weren't getting those components. Mm -hmm. So essentially we were loading um, the HTML fallback, which was missing those dynamic components. And then when the client side loaded, those dynamic components were added. Um, yeah. We're doing weird stuff in Plenty where we're actually, currently we're building the components all in, in a V8 engine. Um, so we actually, when you download Plenty, you don't mm -hmm. need Node.js or anything installed on your computer to actually run it. Um, it'll just like build uh, through that binary that has V8 included in it. So what we're doing is we're actually injecting like in, part of that process and we actually do those builds server side now so like, you should be able to get dynamic components rendering um uh, in the html but there's a lot of so things that... pre-rendering pre pre-rendering yeah exactly yeah. exactly so there's a lot of things that um you know we want to do with this project that, that are um uh, you know different than what we're doing today like eventually we would like to change that compiler step um there's issues with with the v8 runtime but that's not really the, the point of this call so um uh, so basically what we want to do when we're creating plenty is we wanted this idea of you know sim simple static site generation uh, similar to something like a hugo model um but we wanted the interactive component to it to basically have editing capabilities so i was rigging up hugo with netlify cms often so if you're not familiar with netlify cms this is netlify's open source project so there's netlify the platform the hosting platform and then there's netlify cms which is basically a react app that sits on top of your static site generators and it gives you an editor that you can log into and you can um, add pages you can upload images and things like that and then that writes back to your repository so if you have a, a github repository it, it actually writes back to github or if you're on gitlab it'll write back to gitlab um, and it kind of has this full cycle CMS uh, workflow. So you're on your static site, you can edit um, content, and then you save, and basically that does a git commit behind the scenes. And then mm -hmm. once GitHub or GitLab sees your git commit, it will oftentimes look for those changes and it will rebuild through a CI process, and then it will deploy those changes back to your website. So it's this kind of like WordPress Drupal-like editing experience, but you have um, it through a static site generator, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, now- I was actually inspired to up from the Netlify, uh, what what was it? A Netlify content editor. Oh yeah. What Netlify? What was the project you just mentioned? Netlify CMS. CMS. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep. And I think Tina CMS is doing something similar. I, I was looking at their site. They're they're definitely going more towards like um, supporting. I think Next JS specifically these days. I think they they yeah. Because they're they're React based as well, and I think they mm. figured it was just easier to integrate with. Um, like something like Nets and like in building it mm. purpose built for that made more sense for them. Now, but that's I don't kind of... think they have done any CMS after the Netlify CMS, or have they? Have they? Well, what Tina or which part? Uh, Netlify. Oh, have Netlify. They done any CMS components after the Netlify CMS? I don't think so. I think there's. I think that's like. The, I mean, they're they're building that out constantly. But what do you mean mm. additional? Like a, like different types of CMSs? Yeah. Oh, so I'm thinking of this company. I think it's by Forestry.io. Like they, they made this project mm. called Tina. Have you heard of that? 
First Retina. No, no, I haven't. I, my understanding is it's very similar to Netlify CMS. So it's kind of like the oh. get, get Back CMS. But th so they both, mm. so Netlify CMS and Tina are both React projects. And I think what Tina mm. decided, and again, this is me speaking, I haven't really spoke with, with the maintainers in a while, but yep. I think they, they realized that it made sense to kind of like, okay, Next.js is like the most popular React uh, static site generator slash like meta framework. Um, how, like maybe integrating with that makes more sense. Because if you go to their homepage now, it says like, this is the editor for Next.js. And before it was more broad, I think. So, mm. um, and I, I think that was like one of the main problems with um, Netlify CMS. So I was integrating it with mm. Hugo and Hugo, you know, has Go templates on like for the, for the templating engine. And you couldn't really get the previews to work really well because, you know, you needed the previews to be kind of like uh, built in React and like Hugo is not using React oh. by default. So like the previews were always a little weird. Um, there's a couple other things that I always thought were challenging. I felt like I felt like I was yeah. duplicating my effort a lot because, the, you know, you're adding the CMS on top of a project that wasn't necessarily set up to use a CMS. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. And I I think that's the actual actual goal that we have have today to have a CMS for a project that doesn't have a CMS by default. Yeah, exactly. So when so, I was mm. when I was so we have a static static site generator, whatever is it it is, and add a CMS, inject it there. Yeah, and and so yeah, so the the CMS will be kind of injected in this project. And my idea with it, though is I I built. I started building plenty with the idea that it would always have a CMS, right? Like I wanted, I didn't think people, I thought there was all these awesome projects that you could cobble together to make it feel like a WordPress, right? But I was hoping that mm. someone would make something that just kind of feels like a WordPress without all the overhead, right? It's static site generation. Um, you know, it's very easy to, to draw the lines between your content and your display with static site generators, right? It's like, okay, here's some JSON and then I'm pulling that in as a prop and like those things are very transparent. Mm. I like that developer experience. So I was hoping that some point somebody would make something that, you know, you can build that way, and then also you have a content editing capability that you can hand over to a non-technical person. They could and they could edit, and not have to run your own servers and all, all these other things, right? So, um, my my idea was okay. Well, why don't we like? I mean, you could you could take existing projects and, and really couple them together. Maybe that would have been a better better way to go. But I was really excited about Svelte at the time, and I thought that if we could just integrate these things together, and also I thought um, there's a lot of advantage because we have like a single page application, so you could have more dynamic editing capabilities with it. Um, uh, and uh, also our compile time is pretty fast, although I want it to be faster. So like you get that real time feedback loop a, a lot faster, right? You can like save a change and then hopefully soon afterwards that change would be live to, to the world. So that was my thinking on, on creating plenty and where we'd go with it. Um, uh, the, the editing capabilities have been pushed um, just because things have been busy, but I think it's, you know, it's time that we make sure that that, that kind of goes full cycle. So that was, that was what I was thinking. Um, in terms of like how we would actually structure this. Does that make sense? Sorry about the noise. <laughs> oh, no, no worries. No worries. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's a lot of um, steps, I think, in terms of like what needs to be done and how we can approach it. And I have a general idea of how we might do some of this, but um, I think, you know, it's going to take a lot of brainstorming between us um, and maybe other community members that want to help mm -hmm. that, we, that we can figure out um, what to do. So... Um, Plenty is basically a, a command line tool built in Go, right? So, so it, like, um, there's commands you can use to scaffold scaffold things out um, to compile Svelte components, and that all happens within like the Plenty binary, which is just something you download mm -hmm. on your computer. Um, now, what's interesting about having that binary is uh, you can like create a new site, but not all of the site information is necessarily going to live in that site. Like, the binary has this ability to eject things out of it. So there's like core components like routing mm -hmm. and entry points and like all that stuff is actually hidden in the binary. And if you want to manipulate it, you can do a plenty eject command and you can like, okay, eject the router out and now I can edit it. Eject, yeah. eject the entry point out, now I can edit it. But for the most part, we try to hold most of that back in, in the binary. So you're actually just dealing with your, your like template files. It's mm -hmm. like, okay. Using defaults. Yeah, yeah. Here's my homepage, here's my content, like, and that's all I want to worry about. And then if I want to mm -hmm. get really heavy with it, I can eject out. So yeah. the, the way I picture the CMS working eventually um, is it would be the same thing, right? So the CMS would be actually living in the ejectable spot. So I would love, mm -hmm. I, and this is this is where uh, I'm living a lot in theory and non-concept. So just just follow mm -hmm. with me the theory, and we can actually think about like how feasible any of this is um, down the road. But I'm, I'm thinking like, okay, the experience would be something that I haven't seen very often, but I'd love it to be um, this idea that I'm calling in my head like a discoverable CMS, right? So. 
you're not you're not interacting with the CMS too much directly. So the different ways you could do it, right, is like as you're creating templates, you could force your users to kind of like add CMS type capabilities into their templates as they go. Mm. And that's probably the most straightforward way. And, and that's kind of how I actually picture us building this out while we figure out the concept. But eventually, yep. I would love if that process happens kind of organically, where you actually are just creating your templates the way you would create them. And then the CMS mm. is kind of just gets injected. So first of all, the components that make up the CMS are are hidden in the binary and they just get injected during build time in, involved. Unless you want to override them and change them, then you can eject them, change them. Um, and then, uh, so basically in the build, you would have the ability to then edit your website um, locally. So like if you're on your local computer, you would uh, be able to log in without like a password or anything like that. And you, you would be able to basically open a connection between your local file system and your website and you'd be able to save locally. Yep. If you've deployed it, then you set a backend. So either GitHub or GitLab or, or, or whatever um, backend you have, and then you'd be able to, to interact with that repository directly. Um, I'm thinking hmm. to start, uh, let's let's make things as simple as possible. Let's only interact with like one of those backends, probably, probably GitLab, hmm. um, just because it's open source yep. and, and they offer um, different um, types of authentication that uh, GitHub is a little more restrictive in that, in that means. So um, I think that might be a hmm. good place to start. Um, and then in terms of like getting going, I don't think we want to worry too much about like, okay, how do we put this into a, the ejectable system? How do we get in this work? And it's just like, let's start a project. Like let's do a, like a new plenty project. And then let's just start getting logins and components, just like working in there in any mm -hmm. messy way that we can. And then we can think about like, how do we actually abstract this to make this easier for the user? But let's not worry too much mm -hmm. about that upfront, I think. So first prototyping 10 doing the actual implementation. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Kind of, kind of just get, get things working, right? Like let's get some components. Let's get, because this is all going to be built in Svelte at the end of the day, right? Like everything's mm -hmm. going to be built in Svelte. Let's just like, let's build it out and not worry too much about what it's going to look like. Um, and then there's like, I had all these grand ideas of like how this stuff might work on the back end, but it's challenging because Svelte doesn't really work that way. So my first idea was like, okay, you could have these components that live behind the scenes. Let's take for instance, um, like a, like an H1, right? Um, an H1 uh, uh, that, that is like um, content editable enabled, right? So like something that like, mm. okay, if I'm logged in and I have a session and I choose to be in the edit mode, then like I could click on this H1 on the page and I could edit it, right? And so like if a component, maybe there's other things that are involved in it too. Maybe you want like a widget that pops up that allows you to bold, italicize, or underline text, right? So there's, there might be things mm. that are involved in this component that this would be like a Svelte component at that point, right? So I was hoping there might be a way to like, okay, let people write H1s. And if they put like a prop in there, then basically we would, in build, we would inject our own component over it. But, you know, Svelte doesn't do a lot of things. Like it doesn't allow under under um, case or lower case components, first of all. It doesn't allow component mm -hmm. inheritance in that sort of way really either. Um, so there's challenges to actually making that a reality. Yeah. Uh, we could... For the Svelte, or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what yeah, what I have done for the asynchronous rendering stuff. Yeah, yeah, uh, we can or, do that. Um, I'm trying to get away with like as little maintenance as possible. Or we could use a compiler for replacing the markup for the Svelte component and then compiling the component yeah. with Svelte. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot. I feel like almost like we should have this in the back of our minds to brainstorm, mm -hmm. but I almost don't want it to, because yeah. I feel like this stuff is going to trip us. These implementation details are going to trip us up. And I almost okay, want, okay. no, 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 uh, sorry. I don't mean to, th these are great ideas. I'm, I'm just thinking, yeah. I'm just have that turning. Yeah. yeah. Have that turning in your head because it's in my head a lot too. And I'm thinking about like, okay, how, how do we ultimately do this? Um, for now, I'd love to get some brass tacks things done. So, okay. So I think I'm going to switch mm -hmm. over here. Am I oh, I'm not even sharing my screen, am I? Oh, sorry yeah. about that. I've been flopping around, but let me uh, share so you can see it. Um, okay, so I think, well, first of all, I'm starting to, to design out some navigation concepts. I, again, I think this is even getting mm -hmm. ahead of us a little bit because I don't think the UI matters too much until we have some working components, like wor working concepts first. So don't let this get, first of all, these are just ideas that I'm throwing around right now, but like, mm -hmm. I'm just trying to like, um, you know, get some of the, like the, the user interface stuff uh, work together. I have uh, tons of these um, ideas. So there's like, oops, I don't know if you can. 
see, there's, there's like tons of these down here that I'm, I'm working on different ideas um, for like menus of like, wow. you know, what things, what things might ultimately, you know, look like, could they look like that or like this? Um, don't <laughs> worry about this too much because this is, um, I don't think this is important right now, but just to, to, to go through here, I think like, okay, what do we need in a menu basically? But I, I just have to say this, uh, this, this look way better that I have, I had plan, planned for my content edit, edition system because I have, don't have the designer skills <laughs> as you have, or, yeah. Well, I, I think, uh, I mean, uh, you... Uh, um, not designing, but um, layout designing. Sure. They, those look very good. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and they're honestly they're just work in progress. So I'm, I'm right now. I'm, my my plan is to toss around a bunch of ideas, and then I actually. Uh, so this is a cool program, Jesse. If you haven't used this before, this is called Penpot. It's a, it's like an open source um, Figma alternative essentially, and um, so so I can basically create interactive uh, wireframes with this eventually. So I can mm -hmm. do this like prototyping, and my plan is to just uh, I have to figure out exactly what I'm. I'm not sure I'm I'm exactly happy with all this here, but um, once I have something that I think is kind of working, I'm gonna make some interactive prototypes so you can kind of get a feel for like how you would do this editing process. Um, uh, again, this I think this is ahead of where we are today. I'll, I'll explain yep. this just because we're looking at it now um, and for other folks who may be viewing it, but essentially I, I want this editor to be pretty simple. So once you log in, you have a, an active session. Um, uh, we're not gonna manage things. Oh, let me step back actually. So mm. I'm gonna get into a theory of, of where I think the division of development and editing and maintaining the site um, are going to be for this project. So I have a background in Drupal and WordPress. Um, and I think one of the things that I found funny, especially because I, I come from the Drupal community mostly, um, I found it interesting that we have this idea that you can build a site from the website, right? So that, like Drupal is essentially a low code site builder, right? So you can log in, you can add functional components, you can make data relationships, you can make like lists of uh, like aggregate pages where you can like, you know, like a blog page where you have all the different blog posts. Um, so basically you're doing like SQL queries. You can do that all through the, the interface. Um, and the thing that we do with professional Drupal sites these days is we don't actually allow people to um, do the, most people in a professional environment, they do a, a deployable environment where they start locally, they export things to code. So there's um, a system in Drupal called CMI, the configure configuration management uh, interface. And so you basically export everything to like JSON files or YAML files in that case. Um, and then you track them in Git, and then you deploy them to like a dev staging production environment. And we, what happens when you do that is you basically lock your content editors out of the ability to do those code changes anymore, right? So they, we don't allow them to update views, which are those like SQL joins. We don't allow them to change any of the fieldable entities. They call them content types in Drupal. Um, we don't allow them to do the data relationships. So they're basically locked out of all the site builder capabilities, um, which is always creates a confusing conversation, uh, sorry, confusing conversation with them because they have to understand where configuration ends and where content begins. And the admin menu, unless you're like really careful about the permissions that you're giving, like they often have both of those capabilities in their admin menu. So I think that it, in that particular case, it actually makes a worse um, experience for, for everybody. So the content editor has these site builder functionality available to them, which we don't let them use, right? So they're confused. The site builder and the developer wants to use code, they want to use their local tools anyway, so they have a worse experience because now they have to carry all this cruft from a, a site builder um, engine, and then they have to figure out how, a way to make that work with code and actually deploy it. So like, in my mind, it actually is creating a, a confusing experience for everybody. Now, I'm sure there are a lot of people who are making great products that do a middle ground that actually works. So I don't want to just say that's a, a horrible model in general, but um, it, what I decided for this project is I want to have a very clear division between your building site stuff or your managing content. Um, and I'm sure people will debate me on where I've, I've, I've drawn that line, but essentially what I want to do is like, if you're going to be building new layouts or new things for, for, for plenty, I want you to be doing that through your editor. So you're on your local computer using VS Code or whatever you're using, and then you're deploying it. And then if you're maintaining the site, so if you're adding images, you're changing text or rearranging predefined components, then I want you to be able to do that as a content editor. But I don't want you to see any of the site builder functionality. And I don't want to actually build any real like site building functionality into this project. So that's kind of where my mentality was here. Now this menu- I'm actually, I'm actually on page with you because um, this site builder gives too much uh, power to the end user. Yeah. To actually destroy the site if they want or yeah. something like that. Yeah, too, um, too, too much power, too much, yeah. yeah. You, you, and, 
I'm also like really I'm, conscious of, of of this concept of uh, like keeping to style guides now. So like I think if you allow a lot of these um, editors, even when they're not site builders, when they're letting you edit content in like wild ways, I feel like they almost give too much ability for people to get out of their style guide, right? So you, you pay a designer and a developer a ton of money to build a new site. And then a lot of times the content maintainers, like if they don't have an eye for that, they just kind of go crazy, like adding things and changing layouts. And it's like, well, you don't really, you don't really want that. I don't think. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, great. So, so just kind of like giving a, a layout right here. So um, I'm thinking, and this this is going to change. This is just a, a concept right now, but this is just one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm working through. But um, okay, in terms of like you log in, um, normally most editors would have like a user profile page, right? So there'd be like a little like user profile like icon over in the corner. And then you could like, you could log out, but you could also like change your user profile, do this and that. It's like, this site is not going to let you do any of that, right? Like Plentico is just going to be basically set up so you can log out. So once you're logged in, you can log out, but but your user management is all happening in GitLab or GitHub anyways. So if you want to change your stuff, you're going to go there. We're not going to do user profile information here. If you need more extensive like user profiles and like membership functionality, you're probably going to add a, a backend like Supabase or static backend or one of those things where you actually can have full user management. If you're just editing your site, we don't want you doing that. It's just, okay, come in, change text, log out. That's what you're doing. So that, that's kind of like what this, this log out button is here. Then I had... Um, I'm going to skip over this gear for, for a second, but then basically I wanted the idea, and this is, uh, I don't think going to be our first step either here, but the idea of uh, content editable. So being able to like click on like text on the page and be able to edit it. So essentially there's going to be a toggle between viewing and editing. So right now we're on view. So that's what that's like highlighted there. So if you clicked here, nothing would happen. If you toggle this, if you click to the pencil icon, you know, the white circle would switch over there. So you know that that's the active uh, piece. And then when you were to click on things, you would get the appropriate widget for um, the the component on the page. So if I were to click the text, I might get like a, a little pop-up that has like bold, italicized, underlined if I decide to do that. And then I can edit the text right on the page. Versus if I click on an image, I should it should know that this is an image and it should give me like a, an image pop-up that would allow me to um, upload a new image or potentially even um, uh, browse through the component, uh, sorry, the uh, assets that are already uh, incorporated in the site. So if we have like a, an image library or something like that, again, this is like pie in the sky things. I don't think we're going to do all this day one, but I would, I would like the components to be self-aware, right? So that kind of goes into the discoverable CMS part, right? I would love that if it like <clears throat> on the back end it knows, okay, this is, um, this is an H1. I know this is a content editable piece of a text. So I'm going to inject that predefined component there versus, okay, this is an image tag. I know we need to use our image component. That's going to need alternative text. It's going to need this and that. So it's going to, it should do that on the back end. Of course, I think this is down the road stuff that we're gonna have to worry about. Now, um, okay, so assuming that you've switched over to editing, you've made the, the edits that you want, basically what happens here is um, this would normally be like a grayed out zero, but as you make edits, it would um, it would tell you how many pending edits you have here, right? Um, and uh, from there, uh, you could do a couple things. So you could save those edits, which actually does the, the commit to GitHub, and that will kick off the rebuild in your CI, or you could discard them and it should take you back to your initial state. Now, it would be really cool down the road if one day you could click on like this button that has a pop-up of how many edits have been made, and you could see like a, a quick history of the edits that are made, and then you could like X them out if you didn't want them or, or, or leave them if you wanted them and then save. Again, these are like pie in the sky things, not really essential to the project. Maybe someday that'd be nice to have, but I'm just thinking through this stuff in general. So. That's kind of what I'm thinking for like a, a, a basic editing workflow. Um, does it does that make sense? I know you're probably like oh, this seems like a, a big project. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it it makes it makes sense, and it's actually very similar that that I had previously. Great. The lo logic is logic is very similar, but okay. I have um, I have um, one problem with the log. Uh, the login login and authentication mm -hmm. system, the idea. Um, there must be some way to log in and authenticate, but I don't think Git providers um, provide that to the API. Mm. To to lo like to lo lo log in to the um, to the site. You don't think they provide? Okay. Yeah. Um, 
at, at least GitHub doesn't allow logging in to GitHub unless we use actually yeah OAuth probably. Yeah. So okay. So again, I'm not the most well versed, mm. but I, maybe we can dive into that because I actually think that's kind of a good starting point for maybe some of the stuff that we're doing. Um, mm. Can I get? To, I'll get to that in one second. Is that cool? I'm just going to switch over here and just um, just describe the last last bit yep. here, and maybe we can go there. So then, uh, the other functions I think that we need, and I'm not sure I want to um, put these under like a gear icon, uh, but maybe maybe we do. But essentially, I think we need a way to add new pages, like of of all the different types that you create in the system. So if we have events, blogs, whatever, so like a plus to do that. I, I would love, and again, I don't think this is a, a day one thing, but to have component management. So this would be kind of like a slider on the right. So you click this and like you get a slide out on like the right hand side and that would have like your page components, right? So right now this page here seems to have like, okay, a title, a blurb of text, blog post, pagination, and then these like little widgets, right? So you might be able to see those components. And then if you wanted to move the blog post above the description text, you would, you know, through the slide out on the right hand side, you could potentially do that or add new components that are predefined, right? So that, that's what I'm thinking there. And then this last one is just like, okay, everything in, that's content right now is JSON behind the scenes. And sometimes there are things you need to edit that aren't displayed, right? So that's like things like metadata, or if you have any, I, I don't encourage it, but like um, if you have things that like, uh, you can change like the color through like the editor interface, if you want to have those type of things, you might have metadata that allows you to do that. So um, I would like a way to just like be able to actually get at the JSON, the underlying JSON for these different pages by clicking something like that. So just like a, a quick like JSON pop-up uh, editor type thing. Um, again, I don't want to be too code oriented. I want to be more um, more content oriented. So maybe eventually th this would just be like, uh, look more like fields. So it would take your JSON yeah. and put it into like a form, but. Maybe a form, yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the basic idea of what I'm thinking in terms of editing. Again, I, I don't think uh, I don't think making stuff that looks this style right now is appropriate or important. I don't think having all this functionality right now is important. I think we need to get some general concepts down first. So um, you were talking a second ago about login. I think that is like a good place to start thinking about this stuff. So here is um, the Netlify CMS. I think we should use as many existing resources as possible to at least use it as like, um, uh, like, a, like a general guide. Um, and there might be things that I know, I know this is built in React and we're going to be building as felt. So we might not be able to copy things one for one, but I'm sure we can use a lot of the concept, concepts here um, in our own project. So this is talking about the GitLab backend. And like you said, so um, it uses OAuth 2 as a workflow. Now, there are a couple different ways that you can actually authenticate with GitLab. So I actually use, uh, I use this uh, deprecated method, this implicit grant flow um, previously. I actually made a video on it if you're curious of what it actually looks like in practice. But this is um, a video I made back in 2019 um, about, uh, I was using Cobalt at the time. This is like a Rust static site generator. Um, and I was adding get, uh, Netlify CMS to it. And basically I wanted to log into Netlify CMS without having to run an intermediary server. So um, when previously when I had, I used to do some courses on setting up Netlify CMS for uh, GitHub and Hugo. Um, in order to set that up, you actually had to have like uh, like um, something that you might run on Heroku, like a little project that would actually do the authentication for, because you needed a server side uh, authentication step. Now, Implicit Grant allowed you to do that without a server at all. So actually, directly from your static site, you could log into uh, to GitLab, um, and then you'd have like your user session to, to save things. Um, but you know, Implicit Grant has some security issues, so it's been deprecated. Um, now they still allow this other thing called Pixie. So I don't know if you've heard of that, but there is a Pixie flow now, which is supposedly more secure than implicit grant, but it still allows you to do it without the need for authentication server. So I think in terms of making plenty a community project that doesn't require people to pay us money to do anything, uh, which is my, my ideal, um, vision. I, I would love this project to just exist with people being able to use it. Um, I think something like this would be great, right? So you allow people to, to download plenty for free. They can build a site. They can uh, set it up with GitLab without using us at all. And then they automatically have a way to authenticate, save, and have that full life cycle of uh, cha uh, saving changes um, through the user interface without having to know code. Um, and it goes through the Pixie workflow to, to um, GitLab. Now, I don't know how involved this is to set up, but it is something that GitLab or sorry, um, Netlify CMS is doing right now. So I'm wondering if we might be able to use something like that as a model 
curious to hear your thoughts on this. I'm sure you're seeing a lot of this for the first time. So, yeah, um, I have seen some um, some talks about these OAuth OAuth flows and how they differ. Mm -hmm. I have used OAuth before, but actually only implicit and explicit modes. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the Pixie yeah. Pixie flow at all. Yeah, yeah. I started looking into that like a I can't remember maybe like a year ago or maybe not even that long ago. But yeah, it seems like mm -hmm. the new way because I I always had heard that the implicit grant had inherent problems, and that was the one I was using. And I was like, well, if we're gonna be doing this project, we can't be setting people up to have an insecure login workflow. So like, how how do we get around this? Um, and then you know, I was thinking, well, we could have we could offer a service where we set up a server. Oh, my cat wants to talk. Hey, comment. Um, we, we have, we could set up like a service where we do the, the grant for them and, you know, we'd have to host something that would cost money and we'd have, eventually have to force people to, to pay us to do that, you know? So I was hoping to avoid all that. So I'm thinking the pixie flow might be a good, um, direction to look into, but, um, uh, yeah. So, uh, I'm sure that'll take some research on, on both of our ends. Um, another way we could think about starting this is we could think about, okay, um, the local workflow. If we, if we don't want to start exactly with the CMS, um, we could start locally um, in, in getting that workflow down. Although I think that's going to have more interaction with like the command line tool itself because we'll actually have to have um, some kind of uh, socket-like connection between the browser and our, our local to be able to save like that. Um, but actually, Git, uh, sorry, not GitLab, Nellify CMS does do that workflow now. So they didn't when I used to, I used to make, uh, I had a few videos on my old channel that um, I was doing like these, uh, Netlify CMS um, videos, um, but they didn't have a local workflow before, but now they do. I've actually gone through, um, I was helping somebody with set up a Hugo Netlify CMS backend, um, and they they allow you to now like make local edits and save directly to your local computer. So uh, we could, again, we could use them as a model for how they're going through and doing that. I'm actually not sure in the documentation where that is, but I can find that um, and send it to you. But I just figured this is a, a good first step, right? Don't worry about any of the interface type things. Just like, okay, we want a login page on our site where we actually go. Um, we either are doing a local um, uh, workflow or we're doing a GitLab workflow. And then once we're logged in, we have a session and then maybe just have like a gray bar that appears at the top as a placeholder for, for whatever interface we're, we're doing for our, um, our actual admin menu. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a great starting point yeah. for the CMS. Cool. Yeah, it doesn't have to do anything right because now. Just it's, like get a, it's a requirement right to have some kind of authentication. Yeah. To exactly. Restrict everyone, everyone like editing the page, except you could couldn't even do that with Git because Git servers or providers are always require require authentication. Mm -hmm. yep. Unless we have a server that, like Netlify, has a server that, uh, or services that uh, log into your uh, Git provider using OAuth and then proxy the request, mm -hmm. the API request. Yep. Um, yeah. So Unless I we think... are using direct connection, of course. Exactly. Yeah. So I That's think like. Are. Yeah. For now, probably just like just playing around with Netlify CMS and trying to understand how it works. Like I, like I would, I think setting it up and, and taking a look at it might be a good first step. And if you need help with that, I'm happy to help. I, I have some experience doing that. Yeah. And then we can dig through some of their code. Um, and then in terms of, let me just show how I, I, I picture the beginning of this project working. Okay. So I think, it, let me share my screen one more time. And then I know we, we've been talking for a little bit of time, so I want to give you the rest of your day back. I don't want to occupy all your time. But um, I think if you were to try to just, you know, download the repository and hop into it and figure out what's going on there, that might be a lot to begin with, right? Because this is a whole Go-based project. Um, I'm not sure your comfort level with Go, but it might not be something that is the best use of your time for now. So what I actually think the, the, the thing to do now would be, and are you on a Linux or a Mac computer or... or Windows. I'm on Linux. Linux. Okay, great. So mm. you can you should be able to snap install plenty if you haven't already. Yep. So, um, so once you've installed plenty, you can uh, start a new project. And I think actually working off the product, 
like a project that you create itself versus um, like the repository, right? So just to draw the distinction, not everybody understands this, but this is this is the engine that creates like the CLI tool that has all the scaffolding and all that stuff in it, right? And the thing that you create with the tool is like the actual project and they're, they're not exactly the same, right? So like when I do a plenty, uh, let me go on my desktop first. Plenty new site testo. So this, that created the scaffolding. And if I look at like my, my desktop here now, so we have testo, right? So this is like the, the project scaffolding. I think working off this is the appropriate um, step, right? Um, instead of diving into the actual like, oh, whoops, let me, in, instead of diving into like the actual engine here, I think let's work off this, the project scaffolding that's created and just like get the components and things working in that. And then I can help figure out a way to suss that back to actually pull it into like the scaffolding, right? Um, I don't want to, I don't want to trip you up too much. Just like trying to figure out how to put it into an injectable file system or figuring out like which kind of starter it goes into or any of that stuff that's kind of happening behind the scenes. I don't think that's probably the best use of, of time. So I would say like start, start with a project, you know, create, create a project, um, move into that project. Um, and then, you know, you, you can, uh, you can see what you're working with by doing a plenty serve. Um, that build's taking a little while. Um, and then let's see here. I think it's cause I'm recording my computer's a little slow. Um, so essentially building out that workflow into like a project here, right? So, um, you're going to want to add some files to your project here. Oh, my computer's going a little slow. Let me see if I can make this bigger. So like, you know, start a new, so open, open it up in your editor. Mine's going a little slow. Um, and basically in your layouts folder, um, you can go through here and you can actually start adding like components to, to actually build out like a login in that. And and we'll, we'll worry later about putting it into the project in the appropriate places. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah we can, we can... <laughs> Uh, do the lo login uh, on the project, but uh, the actual CMS bro probably needs a compiler, so it will. You, I would have to dive into the whole whole system for that. Yeah. Probably. Yep. Yep. Eventually. Well, so. But um, but yeah, for the first first steps. Yeah, for first steps, I figure like even the CMS stuff. I I feel like the beginning is going to be messy, right? Like the, the way that I picture the progression of this going, and maybe you have a different idea for it, but I, I picture us um, build it. So for instance, we might make a new folder called CMS in here. You could do it however you want. You could just throw them in, in components, right? But eventually you're going to add your CMS components. Like they're going to be, they're going to, they're going to be like Svelte components, right? Most of them. Um, and so you're going to add like your own components to build up the CMS and you're just going to put them wherever they are, they need to be. And then even in our folders, like where they're being used, we're going to have CMS stuff like sprinkled throughout here. So it's going to be messy, but it's going to be like, like the CMS is just going to be very explicit at first, right? It's going to be probably littered throughout our thing, but we just want yeah. cer certain aspects of it working. And then I think from there, when we have some working steps, we can think about like, okay, how can we hide some of this complexity to make it easier for the user? And how do we inject some of it automatically to just make it usable for them? But that, I think that's like step two or three down the road. I think at first it's like, okay, how do we log in? any sort of way? How do we get these components working? How do we get like any kind of editable, editable component in there? Um, and then we'll figure out the next steps later. Does that seem like that makes sense to you? Yeah. Okay. So login and maybe after that, the uh, CMS as, as a, like in the project is as explicit um, things not injected. Yep. Yeah. For now, and we worry about the injection and finalizing the yeah. thing later. It's going to be down the road. I mean, for now, honestly, yeah. I would say like, because we'll, we'll talk next week, right? Is that is that okay yep. with you? Okay. Yeah. It's... I mean, in that amount of time, like, I would say you're probably just going to play around with Netlify CMS today. Try to wrap your mm. head around like what they're doing, how how you might approach like an OAuth, um, Pixie things. Just like it's it's going to be a research yep. week for you, I, I imagine. I don't I don't picture in a week you're going to have much in terms of code written. Mm. Um, but I would say start start exploring that because I think that's the model we're going to use. And the, the better you understand that, the, the better it's going to be for, for this project. I think. Yeah. Awesome.
Cool. Do you, do you have questions or concerns about any of this? I, I know there's a ton to look at. Um, keep in mind, I, I realize it's not going to all happen overnight. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. I, I think the questions arise when, sure. when I go to the research and look looks like look at the Netlify uh, how the how does Netlify CMS how they how they do the things and um, and try to like mimic them yeah somewhat nice um, uh, yeah always feel free to yeah. you know ping me uh, I I'll try to be better about being in Discord I, I typically don't use the app so I didn't look at it but um yep. I'll try to be better Me about being in there and also feel free to use the issue queue as like a thinking space. So like, I try to like, like we're doing now build in public as much as possible, share our ideas, mm -hmm. even if we don't, even if they're just like questions or like not something we ultimately end up doing, feel free to throw your thoughts in, in GitHub because it allows me to have kind of a, a permanent register of like what things we're thinking. Um, it also allows other people who are interested to get involved in it as well. So I'm going to start posting some of like the wireframes and stuff in there. I'll, I'll start tagging you on things that I think are relevant, but feel free to just like brain dump stuff in there if it's helpful. Yeah. Maybe the prototype project should be also in the GitHub repository. Yeah. As a as a, a separate GitHub repository on your on the organization. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Just like prototyping out. I can set so up. So we too. can have conversation in the issue section there also. Yep. Yep, that makes sense. Yeah, so it doesn't get all yeah. muddled up. That makes sense. And everyone can like <laughs> contribute to the con conversation if they want. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds great. Cool. I feel like I've used enough of your time today, Jesse. Is there anything else? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah. It's. Um, not not right now. I have I have no no ideas right now. Sure. For, and my my mind doesn't work. My head doesn't work right now. Uh, sorry. <laughs> no um, worries. I know it's, it's late where you are, getting later. So. Yeah, it's it's six o'clock p.m. here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. Well, anyways, I, I appreciate you hopping on the the call and going through this with me. I, I'm super excited to have you involved in the project. I think, yeah, yeah. you know, like I said, you you were you were the first thought um, that I had to go to when I knew I had to, to to get some help building this out. So I really appreciate you. I'm ex super excited to have you. Um, yeah. I'm. It's uh, it's an honor to be <laughs> honor to uh, do th do the uh, do the cooperation with you. Yeah, same. So yeah. All right, man. Um, yeah, thanks. We'll, and we'll uh, we'll we'll chat. I'm sure, and, and yeah. we'll talk next week on the phone. Um, is it actually possible to that you follow the Discord once in a while? If yeah, uh, if I. I'll, I'll be better about that. Messages <laughs> there. Yep, I'll try to be better about that. I gotta set it up so it at least pings me in the email if I'm not seeing it. So, yeah, yeah. Cool. That would be great. Good. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. So, sounds great. Yeah. Alright, man. Um, oh. And uh, how how do I create the GitHub repositories, or do you create them? I can create them, yeah. So to create one in the org, I'll create one yeah. of those, um, just like as a starting point there, and then I'll yeah. I'll invite you to that so we can like work off that. Something like um, CMS prototyping repository yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yeah, good idea. And so I was thinking, there's there's two different ways we could approach it. So um, Plenty has this concept of uh, a bare repository. I think mm. it might make sense to start from the the full one. Um, just like so, for instance, like you can. Um, plenty new testo to um, so you can create like a bare repository. It has like not very much in it. Uh, yeah. Um, so we could do that, but I almost feel like it might be nice to have.